Já quando quiseres, tenho aqui 6 e 7. É isso, se calhar está na hora de começarmos com. Ou não? Hum. Welcome everybody uh, to this session for those that are accessing to it remotely. In fact, everybody is having access to the session in a remote way uh, due to the circumstances that we, we all know. So we have an empty room here, but a full spectrum of students and teachers and uh, the whole community outside. That's the reason, in fact, why um, we are not using masks, and just to make it very clear. And um, as you know, this is um, the kickoff of our academic year. So first of all, I would like to really welcome to this new 2021 uh, academic year. And uh, before uh, I, I basically give the stage to our invited speaker, I'd like to use five, six minutes to share with you some, uh, some thoughts. Thoughts that I think are important. Um, given that we are kicking off uh, a new academic year in very particular circumstances. So, uh, first of all, um, we all know that we are entering into a very challenging period. We like that. So we here at Catolica, we are ready for that. Uh, it will bring us um, uh, novelties that will be reflected in very practical things and the way the lectures run, the way we interact with, uh, with the whole community. But we are ready for that. We, I think we have been doing our homework. And uh, so we are really looking forward for, for this experience, uh, which will be, I think, very exciting, looking <coughs> forward. Something that I want to guarantee to you, to all of you, <coughs> is that, uh, in fact, everything that we consider to be strategic uh, continues to be on top of the table. So the excellency from a scientific point of view of the programs um, is being obviously continuously uh, reinforced. Uh, the effort to continuously, continuously innovate in you know, ways of learning, ways of teaching. Um, the internationalization continues to be absolutely uh, key for us. So uh, on top of the double degree programs that we have, uh, as you are going to, to notice, um, you will have a lot of, of visiting teachers and we also have a lot of visiting students around. And, and activities that we are doing uh, from an international point of view. Uh, and then something that uh, also is, is, is massively important for us is, is really um, the connection with, uh, with the companies. Um, the bottom line of the, the World Master Program for the majority of our students is the job market. And therefore, for us, it's absolutely critical to prepare them uh, for it, for the job market. And in fact, that's why uh, we try to kick off the years, the academic years, with um, invited speakers that have, uh, in some way, that have been following a successful path, and that represent also a successful path in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of corporate world. And that's why some months ago we, we invited uh, Martin Goetsch, that is here with us today. It's really uh, an enormous pleasure to have him here uh, with us today. Martin is uh, the co-chief executive officer of uh, Vleda, which is a, a very large company uh, working on the wine sector. In fact, it's, I think it's the largest producer and, and uh, exporter of uh, Ving Verde, uh, exporting for uh, more than 80 countries, I think. So, uh, and it's, for what I know, a, a company that has, has been pushing really hard in terms of, um, internationalization, continuous innovation, which means a strong fit with our own uh, corporation here at Catolica. So this fit uh, basically triggered the invitation that fortunately Martin uh, accepted. And I want just to briefly uh, share with you some, um, some notes about who is the speaker. And then of course the stage uh, is, is for Martin. Um, so Martin basically completed his undergraduate. He's still very young. Uh, but he's, he completed his undergraduate in management some time ago. 
And then he started his, his uh, professional career in financial markets and then investment banking. Uh, and at some point decided to, to, to change uh, the path of his career and, and to link it uh, to of leather. And for that decided to make a, an MBA, uh, Barcelona, ESAD, which he completed successfully and very successfully in fact. And then he came back in 2007 to, to Portugal and since then has been working at, at the company at Avleather uh, with different uh, responsibilities, I guess, um, more related with things that uh, were not strictly related with finance, finance and financial topics, so commercial and marketing divisions and responsibilities, and nowadays he's in, he's in the leadership of, of the company. So um, I think Martin will, will use the next minutes to share with, uh, with all of us is is a very rich experience uh, is his career path and also some some uh, s s some events that went through his life at of leather and also the, the story of of leather and martin knows very well the heterogeneity of our of our portfolio of master programs so i think he will try to uh, to describe situations that here and there connect so have different dimensions and therefore connect with our different uh, master programs so uh, on behalf of uh, all the community that is remotely with us, I sincerely want to thank you very much for, for being here. It's really a great pleasure. And, um, and obviously now the, the stage is yours and uh, teach us something. <laughs> Let's see what we can do. So the first words, of course, is to say that I appreciate very much the invitation from Gonzalo and from Universidad Católica to be here. Uh, because I really enjoy having the opportunity to, to share some experience and some thoughts with, uh, with the students and uh, with the whole community. So that's something I am really happy to do. Uh, it's a pity that I cannot see you physically in front of us, but it's, it's the times that we live in. So <coughs> to sort of make up for that, I would like to invite you, whoever is interested, to connect to me with uh, LinkedIn. So there's so that we can connect in, in, in some ways. But uh, and now I would like to share, of course, the, some thoughts and some, some ideas that I hope might be interesting. Uh, so first I will speak a little bit about myself, about my career, my path, my options. And then I would like to share some random thoughts on things that somehow are related to management and might be interesting for you or might at least stimulate the discussions that I hope we can have after after we speak. Uh, so, <coughs> going, so now I go back to the past, a few years back. And uh, my career, I was, I was lucky in many ways. And I, had a, and I think the first way in which I was lucky was in, I never had doubts about what I wanted to follow or which kind of uh, areas I would like to, to study. And that was very, very early on in my life. So I was, uh, I was eight when I, when I remember first time thinking about this and uh, reading some books about uh, Uncle Scrooge, which you might be familiar with, I hope you still, yeah, people still read about him these days. And uh, so I, I read those books and I said, that's, I want to do something like this. I, mean, I might not have called it management at the time, but I used some other words, but I knew it was something on that level. And, uh, and that, that was something that was confirmed very, very briefly. So I read those first management books <laughs> when I was eight. When I was nine, I, that was, well, actually, that was the only time in my life I actually started a company was when I was nine, but uh, mm -hmm. still the, <laughs> the idea was good. So with a friend of mine, he was a guy called Pimentel, so we launched Kedge and Pimentel <laughs> Limited. <laughs> we sold cakes, and uh, it was a good business. We, we were in business for a year, and we made a profit of uh, 10,000 escudos, which was, which was nice money, at the time. It was money at the time. It was money. <laughs> And we split it and buy some toys, but uh, well, that was <laughs> that was an interesting venture. <laughs> well, and then on in my career, uh, I had something that I think it's not so professional, but interesting to to to, to speak about in my teenage years, which was uh, sport in competition. So I, I I played golf competitively, and I think that was also a good, very good learning and very interestingly, uh, I. Not that I was very, very talented, but I remember I worked hard, and most importantly, there were not many golf players in Portugal at the time, so I managed to play at least once for the national team. I don't think that would be possible nowadays, but uh, it was a, an opportunity to have this experience was, was very, very, very interesting. 
So then at 18, I uh, had to start studying and uh, the choice was not very difficult. It was something within business and I ended up choosing finance. Uh, it, was, it was not here, but it was in um, Spasso Atlantico because it was the only course at the time that had financial management on, the, on those days. So that was in uh, 1995. And uh, so I took finance. It was uh, I like the the subject very much, and um, I started getting onto management, and especially financial markets were an area that I got interested very very early on. And then um, something sort of happened by chance or not, and one very interesting thing that happened to me was that in the second year. Uh, I had a, a very interesting subject was uh, financial operations and techniques. I think that's how you translate that into English. And it was a, a subject that I really liked very much. And I liked the teacher very much. Uh, and so I was a bit surprised when I finished my fourth year. I still had one to go because the, the courses were five years at the time. And uh, I finished, I think that was June or July, and I just finished the fourth year. I received a call from the, the guy who was my teacher in the second year, um, inviting me for a conversation about uh, a job that he might have to offer. And so that was very nice because I still had one year to go. And he presented me when I, about an idea about working in, he was opening some bank branches that were specialized in stock markets. And that I was very excited about the idea, so I accepted right away. Uh, so I sort of negotiated with him, okay, we'll wait for six months and then I'll start and then I'll do six months working and studying and we'll sort it out and I was happy about that. I remember that then I, I got home and I told my parents how happy I was. I, I wasn't even looking for a job and I already had a job, so that was really nice. And then they asked me, oh, that's very good, when do you start? I said, okay, I start in January and, and how much are you going to earn? And they go, oh, I forgot to ask that. <laughs> But now I don't feel comfortable about calling back and asking about that. So maybe in the, in the end of the first month, we'll have an idea of the, how's that going to happen. So a lot of confidence on the counterpart. Yes, and especially on the person. I mean, knowing the person I was going to work with was very important for me mm -hmm. at the time. And, um, and, uh, and, and I think that's a, v a very important point. It, it was not intentional, but uh, we don't have an option to choose our bosses many times. And it is interesting because when we ask people, what are the most relevant factors f when they, they choose a job or they choose a company to work for. People talk about many of them. And, and, and there's one that normally doesn't show up spontaneously, but when you ask people, it makes a lot of sense, which is the boss that you work for. I mean, when mm -hmm. you look back, and, and I know we shared some experiences. I know you had some very similar experiences to the ones that I had, and you had very good bosses in your career, and, that's, and that really helps us. It's very important, and people sort of forget that when they, they choose a job. And working for, a, let's say, an average boss or a good boss or even a bad boss, it's, it's totally, totally different. So that was, for me, it was very important to know who I was going to, to work for. And that was also interesting in my second experience because I worked for two years there, and I went, then I went to Lisbon because I knew I wanted to manage money. Well, in my first job, I was advising people to invest in the stock market, which is different from having your, your own account to manage. So that would be the log next logical step. I knew that involved moving from Porto to Lisbon, but that's OK. And so that was in 2002 that I moved to Lisbon, two years afterwards. And um, I went to a company called BPI Fundos, or BPI Asset Management, as it's called now. So I was going to man manage pension funds, which was a great opportunity that I accepted very quickly. And it was interesting that my first boss was a very intelligent woman, very smart person, very competent, but I didn't like to work with her. She didn't delegate much. She took all the decisions, we executed, and people were happy about that. I was not. <laughs> And I was lucky then, because three months after, after I got in, and that was a total coincidence, they, they changed the, the boss. And so I had the opportunity to work with somebody who was totally different, and I worked with a guy called Francisco Carneiro, and he was a um, very special person. He was sort of starting telling, forget about all that you learned, it's all going to be different from now on, and he's a very out-of-the-box idea. <laughs> you know him, so you know the <laughs> personality, <laughs> character. <laughs> 
but that was a great opportunity. I mean, when you're 24 years old and you want to learn, and uh, I mean, somebody who's giving you total autonomy and uh, telling you about how things can be done differently at the time, it's a great opportunity. And most people were not adapting to that very well because they were used to the old way of doing things. I had just arrived, so it was not a problem for me. So there, there were a lot of opportunities in those years, and uh, very quickly I had a lot of responsibilities and managing money, and with a, with a lot of, let's say, enlightenment and new ideas, a lot of brainstorming. So uh, I was very, very happy in, in, in finance, and uh, I liked the years that I, that I spent in, in BPE very much. Uh, but then, at some point, started getting interested in my family's company, and my family had a wine business for five generations, so that's always something to think about. And my father and my family started getting me involved in the business, going there, understanding the business, and I got a bit curious about would this be an option for me or not. To be honest, before I was very focused on financial markets and I was happy there, but then I, I started thinking, why not? And so that's the thought that started growing. And uh, I started taking the idea seriously, and then I, I told my family, OK, I'm, I'm interested in, in getting into the, the wine business. We are 14 cousins, one four, so we're a lot. And so it's not an automatic process, but somehow I managed to convince them that that could be a, a good idea to try. And they accepted. <coughs> And one interesting point was that I said my, my whole specialization and my, my studies and my experience was all in finance, all in banking. And in uh, the wine business, there are other areas that are very important, like marketing and sales. And uh, I didn't have much experience there. And I said, I, I want to complete maybe my, my, my studies and my, my knowledge with something that can help me, especially in the marketing area, which uh, I didn't have much experience there. And so that's why when I had this idea about doing an MBA, and I had this great opportunity to do a full-time MBA, so it's an year when, one year where you're totally focused on yourself, and, and there's a lot that you, that you can learn. And I had the opportunity to go to Barcelona, which is an excellent city, and meet people from all over the world. So it was a great opportunity to, to say, redirect my career and uh, know about other areas and improve knowledge in the areas where I was weaker and complement that. And uh, so above all, I think it was a great experience. You, you learn from what you learn in the classes. You learn from other students. And if they come from uh, 25 different countries, as I, if I recall, that's where they come from, that's an even more enriching experience. So that was a, that was a very interesting one year of my life, which I, I don't regret at all. It was a very interesting experience. And so that's when I go to Avleda, as it was all planned and, uh, and forecast. And so I, <coughs> I started to work in the, in the marketing area. So I wanted to make my way up from where I was less comfortable, rather than starting in finance, which would have been more comfortable. One thing I remember from the first few days and um, coming from finance to marketing, uh, one thing that shocked me was how comfortable I was in finance about you always know the result, right? I had a monitor in front of me, and every second it was telling me, are you making money, are you losing money, and you do well or you do bad, but you know it. In marketing, it's the opposite. It's, it's a bit confusing for, for the start, because you never know if you're doing well or if you're doing the right decision or the wrong decision. I mean, there are many theoretical models about uh, marketing decisions and how you evaluate, for example, a marketing campaign. But in the end of the day, there are so many variables your price can change, your competitor's price can change, your, 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 your product might be, you might be out of product, out of stock, or you have, may have more distribution or less distribution. In the case of Inuverde, you can have warmer weather or cooler, cooler weather. So in the end of the day, there are so many variables, you never know if the decision that you did in the end of the day, mm -hmm. was it positive or not? So that's something I sort of miss, that objectivity that finance gives you to know. It is very comfortable. Yes. You might go wrong, but you know that you're wrong. You know you're heading. It's like if you're, if you're going the highway and you're going the wrong direction, at least you know we're going the right direct, right. in the wrong direction. <laughs> if you don't that's know, well, that's when it becomes a problem. <laughs> but well, that's learning. I always then you were, talk you were talking before about the quantitative side of marketing. That's something always interested me, and a lot of market research and hearing about the consumers. That's always been a, a very interesting part. So trying to at least get some objectivity. Into, into marketing decisions, that's 
very challenging intellectually, and that's an area that I still like very much now nowadays. So one final thought about this, which I think it's interesting to, to share because it's not very common. Um, so nowadays, I'm uh, leading the business. I'm actually co-CEO of the company. So that means I, I lead the company with somebody else, which is my cousin, Antonio. So both of us run the company. And that's an, a very interesting theme that I don't think it's very explored in management books, which is co-leadership. Leadership is normally done uh, solitarily or single. Uh, and I find it very interesting. I mean, in my family, it's quite an exception. For the last 70 years, we've been doing always in co-leaderships. It was my grandfather with his brother, and then my uncle with his brother, then my father with his brother, and then me and my cousin. So it's four, four pairs in a row. So this is kind of normal when you look at my family, but it's not normal in, in business in general. And uh, I think it's a very interesting area of management, because it's not just about how you split areas like my cousin's background is, is in agriculture and um, production, and mine is in management. So it's very easy for us to, to split which areas will report to myself or will report to Antonio. But OK, that's the easy part. But I think the really interesting part is when you, you're not taking decisions alone. You have somebody you can discuss with, you can share the decisions with, um, you can talk with. And uh, it's not so sol solitary as the mm -hmm. normal CEO job, which can be quite a standalone job at some point. So that's an experience that I find uh, very interesting. And I don't see it, I don't see it uh, very often. Mm -hmm. I do see some news from, from time to time. I think it's Netflix that uh, last week decided to go on, on uh, having two leaders, which is not so common. But uh, it's, uh, I think it's an interesting uh, field of study. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe now a word about the Vleda. I mean, I hope most of you know the company, but and or at least some of the brands. But uh, in, in in a nutshell, so uh, Vleda is present in 75 countries. It's been around for 150 years, uh, so it's a very traditional company. I'm part of the fifth generation, so it's the leader, as Gonzalo said, in the Vino Verde category. But we're also present in the Douro, in Bajada, and the Algarve. So we're present in four different regions. In Portugal, we try to have one brand in each region, try to have a very organized portfolio. So we have the Avleda brand in Vinho Verde, we have a Quinta Val Dona Maria in the Douro, we have Vila Alvor in the Algarve, in the Alvor city, and then we have in Bairrada a Gueira brand. And then we have one brandy, one Aguardente called the Dega Velha. And then finally, uh, last but not least, we have Casal Garcia, which it's a well-known brand. It started as Vinho Verde. It's now got nine different products. It's got rosé wine. It's got sparkling wine. It's got sangria. So it's developed a lot. As a marketeer, it's probably the brand that I enjoy most working with. It's a, it's a brand that resonates a lot with the consumers. It's the top of mind uh, brand in wine in Portugal. One very interesting experience, for example, I mean, we've been sponsoring Noz Alive uh, Music Festival, which I guess most of you will know. And most of you have been there, so you probably witnessed what I was going to say. But we sponsored that. And, we, and, uh, and sometimes there, there are some ads with music about Casal Garcia. And they, they speak, Aja Algria, Aja Casal Garcia, singing. I will not sing, but you, you, can, you can see what I'm, what I'm referring to. And, and it's so interesting to see that people spontaneously, then all the people who are in the festival, they start singing and dancing the, the music of Casal Garcia, because they really connect to the brand. And they, they love the brand, and they know it. And, and they share a lot on, on the um, uh, social, uh, media, social media, social networks. They share a lot uh, about Casal Garcia spontaneously. So it's, it's a brand that consumers really like to talk about. So it's, it, it's a very enriching brand to, to have the opportunity to, to work with. And so now some random ideas. And uh, <coughs> I talked about Casal Garcia and I talked about the sangria. And there's one example that if, if there's something that I would like to bring as an interesting experience that might be interesting for you to know about. It was probably the most successful launch that we had of a new product was, was Sangria. And it was two years of research, so it was, the, it was a very well thought process. But in the end of the day, it was very re rewarding for us, not just because it had very interesting numbers, and that's not, not what I want to talk about, but how we got there, because 
In Portugal at the time, sangrias were very well known, but it, they were most in plastic bottles. And we did some research and we found out that 86% uh, of respondents in that survey used, at least had in the, last, in the previous year, an experience about having sangria in the restaurant, but only 13% had an experience of having sangria at home. Not, of course, they know how to make sangria at home, but it's just uh, a lot of work and it's not convenient and people wouldn't do it. So we understand that if we had convenience and we had a ready to drink sangria to have at home, there would be a market for it. And that's what we tried to launch. And uh, the distributors were a bit scared because the price was not the same as the competitors who sold on plastic, on plastic bottles. But having a glass bottle in the sangria really showed how it was a more premium one and more ready to drink. And we communicated that correctly. And it became a, a success very, very quickly. So it's something I really believe in marketing, which is if you have something that's a, a value proposition that is unique and that is relevant for the consumers, it will work. Uh, some people call it a blue ocean, or there are many ways to call it. I heard this from a, a consultant that we had that I, I learned a lot with him. And I, I always remember this statement, uh, proposta de valor única e relevante para o consumidor. In Portuguese, that's how I remember it, but it's the same as I did. And the difficult thing is to get something that's unique, but is relevant at the same time. And not many times in your life you're going to find I mean, you can have a, a car with five wheels, that's very unique, but that's not relevant for anybody. So the difficult thing is to get, and, and this sangria it was, because um, um, it was unique, there were no other glass bottles, sangrias in, in, the, in, the, in the market, and it was relevant because it's a convenience for, for the consumer, and they really valued it, so, so it was. And it, it ranges a lot, and I know there are lot, uh, some students that are here from finance course, I think. Yep had a similar experience in finance, and it's the interesting how you can compare such different things. But when I started in BPI, BPI asset management, uh, my boss in, was talking about something that was not common in Portugal in 2004, which was uh, quantitative models for management, which you know better than I do. But at the time, they were not common in the market. So we started managing in a way that nobody was doing. Everybody was doing the very traditional way of management, looking at macro, looking at company fundamentals, everything that's in the books. And so we were doing something different from the rest of the competitors. And luckily or not, in, after a year, we were having better results than our competitors. So it was very easy to sell to new clients to say, hey, we, we have a way, a method of managing that's different, and that works. Mm -hmm. So that's much better than saying, we have better results, but we're doing the same as anybody else. So in the end of the day, we had a value proposition that was unique and that was relevant for, for the investors in that way. So that's something that, if we can apply it, can be very interesting in very different areas. So <coughs> maybe from here, I would jump to a totally different area, and which is sales. That's an area that I'm particularly close to because as a, as a, as a manager, that's something that when you wake up in the morning, if you think the, the first thing that you think about, and if you, if you are a part owner of a company, especially, it's how much you are selling. That's the first question that, that, that you make when you get into the company, because sales really drive what's, what happens in, in, in the company. So I'm not saying the other, other areas are less important, but sales are, are the first one in our mind, because when sales are growing, the company develops after it, and it's, everything is easier. When, when you are losing sales every year, then everything is difficult. So that's the, the main variable that drives really the other. And that's very important for a company. Uh, and I always like to, my, when, when I talk in the academic, uh, in the academia community, I always like to point out this just, just, just to, to, to share some thoughts and do a bit of brainstorming and make people think about it. Because if you look at the company, probably the best paid jobs and the, and the ones that we think about first is, is in sales. When you look at the curriculum of most uh, management courses, uh, probably the area that you will see the least will be sales. You, you don't see many subjects about sales in, in a typical management uh, uh, course. When, when I took my management course, I had zero about sales. I didn't have one subject about, uh, about sales. It was zero. It was considered not important. It was at the time considered like, you know, if you're sell a salesperson, you're just like the guy who's selling. Uh, cable TV on door to knocking on the doors and selling cable TV uh, on, on, on a door-by-door -door basis. And, and that's not it. That's not the way I see 
a salesperson in a company like mine is uh, totally different. I call it a three, 360 degrees management because they have to manage everything. They have to manage, ideally, they, they are not just selling products into their clients, they are managing their client's business. Mm -hmm. They need to know everything. They need to know what stock levels their client is going to keep, who he's selling to, what's his price strategy, uh, how is he placed on the shelves, uh, what's this competition, uh, how many sales salespersons he's going to put behind the brand, how are the sales incentives going to be determined. So one salesperson has to know everything about management. Uh, he has to know the finance side, if payments are, are, are done or not, the credit conditions. So he's man managing a lot of things. So I want to say this because I think sales jobs are much more diversified than people imagine. I, many times I interview people, and I remember I hired a few people from Catholic a few years ago from here, and, it, and they were good hires actually, I'm happy about that. But uh, I'm happy no. hearing that. Yes, <laughs> 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 that's that's true. But I know not many people were interested in in a, in a sales job. I know most people would prefer to go on marketing or finance or other areas that are more that w might be more appealing. And uh, uh, and I feel that we're not passing the right message because mm -hmm. not that many people are interested in, in, in sales jobs. So that's something that I think it's interesting to have in, in your mind. That I think it's a really valid option. When you when you graduate to go start in a, in a sales job, I think it's a really valid option. Of course, if you like it, if, if you don't like it, that's <laughs> totally. No, that's also story. sorry to interrupt, but Please? it's also nice to it's, it's also a, a, let's say a good working point for us here at Catholica, uh, because it's Catholica that uh, today we are talking about mm -hmm. the context of Catholica. Uh, it's 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 very important as I started to emphasize in the beginning this connectivity, connectivity with the corporate world, one of the reasons exactly because of this, we need to have feedback of uh, you know, the dynamics in terms of relevant topics where we can improve. So definitely this kind of, uh, I'm not saying that we are not strong uh, at, at, uh, at the sales topic. Uh, maybe we could be stronger eventually. Mm -hmm. So I'd be very happy to, it's a working point. Okay, so uh, it's, it's a very nice tip to pay attention because honestly, um, especially when we think in terms of the programs as a wall. Sometimes we, we miss the picture in terms of details that at the end of the day from a job market perspective are in that, in a certain specific period of time are massively important. I think for example, IT competence is another example, right? It's like 20 years ago, maybe it's what was not critical. Nowadays programming in finance become, became massively important. So. Yeah. So thank you very much for pointing, yeah, for pointing and it out changes that. And, uh, actually, my next point was sort of related to IT because I was talking about digital marketing. And it's just a random point that I'd like to make. And uh, I mean, I'm not going to teach you anything about digital marketing. Maybe you, you know more than I do because it's changing so fast. But uh, there's one aspect that maybe many people don't realize because it's changing so fast in companies is that the areas of the marketing departments are changing very rapidly. and. Uh, like, if you think about it, 15 years ago, a marketing department, how, how we worked in a very traditional way was that you developed an ad and a campaign, and if it's good, and then you, you put it on the media for three years. And, all, and most of what you do for three years is buy media space in TV, in outdoors, and in magazines, or the radio, and, and that's it. So we spent a lot of money in media, and a, a little bit of money in creating the ad and some agencies from time to time, but not every year, and, and people, and we didn't spend m much money in people because it was not needed. And if you think about it nowadays, it changed totally, and it changed dramatically. And uh, we are going to need much more people in, uh, in digital marketing in, in the future, and I think that's gonna grow in the job market. And, and why is that? It's because if, if you think about it, uh, now we don't create a message every three years. No, we create a message every three hours. I mean, uh, if you think every brand that we have has to make a post on Facebook and Instagram and other social networks once a day, so that's five posts a week. We have six brands, so that's 30 posts a week, just posts, and then we have mm -hmm. to create videos. <coughs> and if those contents are good, they're going to circulate on YouTube or LinkedIn or uh, other platforms, and, and they're going to become viral. So if you make good contents, they're going yeah. to spread. And most times they're going to spread almost for free. Because if you want to put uh, something on Facebook, it's for free, or you might pay, but it's quite residual. So I think in the future, the media is going to be almost free. You don't pay much to vinculate if you have the good contents. 
And if you're a factory of very good contents, then they are going to spread mm -hmm. cheaply. But that, then you have to spend your money in creating very good content. And our experience is that we start doing it outsourced in agencies, but then you really have to be close to the product and know the product. So yes, so sooner or later, we have to make it internal. Mm -hmm. So we have to have somebody to create text and creativities for what we're going to post. Or, and then we have to have somebody to do photographs and to do videos, and we have to have a data analysts to show all the data that comes from Google and Facebook and etc. to see how we can mm -hmm. show the ad. Mm -hmm. So in the end of the day, we're going to need many, many people just working on contents. And if those contents are good, they're going to spread. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this shift between media money, money spent in media and money spent on ads and in creativity, it's changing totally. Mm -hmm. So I believe marketing departments are going to have a lot more people and a lot more people doing uh, creative, uh, creative jobs. So that's sort of a, a tip that might be interesting in the in the years to come if this if this tendency grows like I mm -hmm. imagine. Mm -hmm. So finally, something on HR also, and and here is an area where I think it conver my practical experience really converges a lot to what what's written and and said in academia. And when people say culture is very important and values are very important, my answer is yes, they are. There's, <laughs> there's not much more to it. But many comp companies, sometimes they're not very disciplined in implementing it. And, but if you do it correctly, I think it has a massive impact. You cannot measure it. It's very difficult to measure what's the impact in euros or dollars of having a good company culture. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have no doubt, and I really believe it's, it's very important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I in our company, we have a very strong culture. We hope we try to do it. And it's a 150-year-old company, so the culture has to be strong. And uh, we try to base it on very strong values and we, 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 we base it especially in two behaviors that we expect from people which is we want people to be humble but at the same time ambitious and this combination is very interesting because it's easy to be humble if you're not ambitious and it's very easy to be ambitious if you're not humble mm -hmm. it's difficult to be the same True. and to be very curious i mean when you know a competitor is doing better than yourself you have to be humble to understand that he's doing better sure. but ambitious to know, to know that i want to do to as well as he yes. does or even better and if you have more and more people uh, doing that, the culture gets really interesting because it really generates a lot of energy within, within the people. But then they don't, if they remain humble, and they get successful, but they don't say, no, we're the best and we don't have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to, to avoid that. And if you can com combine these two factors, I think it's, a, it's quite an interesting uh, culture. Mm -hmm. And there's one book that I recommend in this area if you like reading. Um, and this is the From Good to Great from Jim, Jim Collins. It's an old book. It's got more than 20 years. But for me, it's one of the best m books I ever read. And it emphasizes this point very, very, very well. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's curious, you, you can learn more on, on that book. And I was just going to recommend a, a different book in a totally different area. And uh, now I'm going to talk just a little bit about work-life balance. And I know this is a very interesting uh, generation issue about how much we work, if we work too much or not. And if you look at my uh, and Gonzalo's generation, probably and from the millennials onwards, you really think that we're a generation that works too much, that stresses too much. And in the end of our lives, we're probably going to re regret spending too much time at the office. I don't know if that's true or not. I know the new generations don't look at it this, this way. Uh, you started in auditing, and I know Things are very different these days in, in auditing. In the old days, if you had to stay until midnight, that, that's it, that's life. Yeah. And nowadays, people look at it differently. And I respect that, and I understand that. And this can be a long discussion, but I think most interesting than this is, is to look further, and it's look at what science is telling us. And I think it's not so much about you working more or less. It's uh, how you, manage, uh, yeah. how you yeah. manage stress, how you manage the way you work. and and and. This book, it's called Reload by José Suárez. He's a professor at uh, Sport University here in Oporto. And it's a great book, uh, Reload. I like it very much. And it focuses how much he learned from uh, athletes, from high competition athletes, about how they manage. Mm -hmm. And if you look at athletes, they are not always sprinting. They're not always performing. They have times when they're performing, mm -hmm. and there are times when they are recovering. And if they're recovering, they're not sprinting. Nope. 
And, but we don't do that in business. We, we go to bed and we're looking at the email at 11 o'clock at night. So we're, we're not repairing ourselves and we're not recovering mm -hmm. next day. So I think there are much more, science can help us a lot more about separating when we are working and we are not working and we are recovering and we should not mix that. And when people are in this gray zone where they're working and they're not working at the same time, that's when I think it really gets counterproductive and it happens a lot. So I think if you manage well, the how much hours is spent on the office becomes a less important uh, issue and, and how you manage your stress and your well-being becomes more important. There are lots of techniques and mindfulness and these books and um, uh, science really goes much further into this nowadays. My last point is just about uh, what you're doing right now and I think it might be interesting in the area that you are which is about the acquisition of knowledge through your life. And I remember at this point of our lives when you're we're 16, 17, 18, and we're discussing which area to go with. I remember one discussion about a couple of friends, and they were one saying he was considering going to medicine, med school. And the other said, no, no, you shouldn't go, go to med school, because doctors have to study all their lives. I said, oh, no, no, so I, I won't go to med, med school, that's bad. <laughs> so this maybe is to show how old we are and how different the world was a few years ago. But most importantly, that nowadays it's quite obvious that we need to study through our lives in, in all areas, regardless if it's med school or, or if it's something else. And the point that I, or the advice that I really like to say is that I think all of you, and I advise this to, to the people that work for me, is that you should have, when you're working, a, a proactive strategy of acquisition of knowledge, which means that you should not wait for your boss to say that you need to do an Excel, an Excel course next week or your English course next week. That, that's not the point. You need to drive what you want to do. And for example, myself, uh, what I like the most is reading. I like reading books a lot and I like, uh, I'll read a lot of management books. Some other people prefer to go to conferences or to go to all kinds of different formal education and formal courses like, like these ones. Uh, other people like to listen to podcasts or there are so many different ways for you to acquire mm -hmm. knowledge uh, or like to learn from others. It doesn't matter, but I think everyone should try to have an acquisition to, to learn and, and, and to drive their own acquisition of knowledge through their, through their careers and, and don't wait for other people to tell you what you should learn. So that would be my final message. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, Martin. Thank you very much for your words. Uh, now we have, uh, I'd say, some five to eight minutes for Q&A. I'm going to see if I receive here some, some questions. Um, um, so let me see. So I receive here more a comment from uh, Susanna Silva. I guess it's a colleague from us <laughs> saying that good that we teach sales management at the master level. So <laughs> there you have. There is already an well output from our call. <laughs> and, um, and then we have is also here another question. Well, this was more a logistic one. So I guess that um, students and all the tenants knows that you can just type down um, eventual questions or comments that you want to, to make related with this call, uh, with, this, uh, with this event. Um, uh, in the meantime, bef as we are not receiving anyone here, I, I'm... I'm They're know, all very shy. Uh, sorry? They are a little bit shy. Maybe it's because we, this is this special environment of having empty rooms and cameras, but uh, I know Martin since a long time ago. I, I didn't make the disclosure at the beginning, <laughs> so I wanted to keep this more formal <laughs> and less, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it's a fact. And uh, I think he's very humble. So um, I think here you have an example of someone that uh, really tried to be continuously ahead of the curve in terms of wha what he we could do in terms of, uh, professionally speaking, <coughs> of enhancing skills. Um, we all, never ne we all, all of us have, uh, I would say, a natural fit for something. Uh, athletes, uh, golf players for to play golf, uh, football players to play football, some of us like more finance, others to make sales management. Uh, a very important thing um, is really that we, we, we do the best we can given the resources we have and that we are, we look forward and we ask ourselves continuously, uh, where do we expect to be within 10 years and doing what and why? And I think uh, our invited speaker today uh, made that in a very critical and practical way. He's a very pragmatic guy <laughs> uh, at the very early stage of his career. 
So uh, this decision of moving from a zone very financial related zone uh, that was comfortable to an uncomfortable one was a wise one with an outstanding um, results that are out there. For anybody can monitor that from the performance of the company. So this is something that I invite you all of you to do in your, uh, not only in the master program that you are just kicking off, but as a way of thinking and a way of, of, uh, of in some way taking benefit of what in this next year, for example, Catholica will try to offer you. So be proactive and try to push from us, from the, from the teachers, you know, from the school, and try to use the school to help you uh, to define and to think what you want to do uh, uh, looking forward. And I would like, uh, we still don't have more, we have got here more questions, so uh, that's good. Um, we have a question from uh, Mariana Tumult Figueiredo, um, asking if you could uh, repeat the books that you recommended to be, to read. Okay, I'll try to say them very slowly, Mariana, so that you can uh, <laughs> take notes. So one is from, from good to great. I think it's the, the bon excellent in Portuguese, because I know it's, I read it in English, but it's translated. The author is Jim Collins. Uh, so his, his book is dedicated to, uh, I think the best question I've ever seen in management is, why some companies are better than others? Is that luck? How does it happen? Is that is that because they have uh, some different resource or not? And, uh, and, and has very strong evidence on that. It's so, but I, I'll let that to the book that you're going to read. The second one, Mark Silly, the name is in English, Reload. Well, it should be Recuperar in Portuguese, but actually the, the original title is in English, but the book is all in Portuguese. And the author is called José Suárez, as I said, as a, a professor of uh, uh, sports, Porto Sports University, also a, a great book. Apparently, um, you are recognized as a good, uh, great um, uh, advisor reading books because the next question comes from Maria Clara George and say, Martin, please tell us about some of your favorite books. Oh, that's a tough question. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very organized guy and I, I like Excel, so I keep a, a long Excel about uh, books that I read and that I, I like for some reason, so it's a, uh, it's a, long, it's a long list. These, these two are, are, are very good. In a, well, just to say some that might come up to my, to my mind. The, a few books, I, I don't remember the name, but if you can search the author, it's called Dan uh, Ariely, with a Y in the end, Dan Ariely. So he does a lot of research, he's a vast research in, the, in psychology and in the rational and the irrational side of our decisions about how we make decisions. He has, a, I read a couple of very good books from him about studying about when we we think we are doing rational decisions and the end of the day they're not rational. And to understand that it's, it's very interesting. I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's a, I think the name of the book is The Upside of Irrationality. Uh, website da Irracionalidade. <laughs> uh, and the other book, I don't remember the name, but he's a, he's a very good author. I mean, if, if you want to study deeper, I, I read the book, I don't know if I could read it again because it, it's, it's a very deep one, but if, if you're brave enough to do it and you have the time, it's the book from Antonio Damasio. So that's something that's very proud, and I'm very proud when I read because, you know, Antonio Damasio, he's a professor in California, right? So he's a ne neuroscience professor. And of all the books I read about neuroscience and neuromarketing and neuropsychology, I think the most quoted author was always Antonio Damasio. All of the books I read at some point quoted Antonio Damasio. So he's Portuguese and he's probably the best researcher in the world about uh, neuroscience, which is something that's very proud for us. His book is The Error of Descartes, was the first book. I know he's just launched another one, he has a lot of books, but if you wanna go really deep into neuroscience, then that's a huge guy to read, but that's probably not for, for, uh, for everybody. Uh, in marketing, I like the, the books from All Rice, All, A-L, Rice, R-I-E-S, but he's a very well-known guy, so he, he writes a lot of books, the ideas are basically the same, so he's, he's very good. So that's just a few that come up to my, to my mind. Okay, so um, I'm very happy that we are receiving here some, some questions. Mm -hmm. So um, 
We have here one from one of our uh, international students, uh, Marian Merpur. I don't know if this is the proper way of spelling it. Sorry, Marian. But anyway, the question is, what does uh, Martin advise to students whom studying management for the first time in order to be successful in this major? Well, first thing, I think, Mariam, you already done that, is to, to like management because you really have to, to like it. I think it's the, it's the, mo the most important thing. Uh, and then I think the, the, the start of your career is, is very important. Think a lot about the, what you are going to choose. Uh, one thing that I know it's hard today and it's hard for all of you is the, the, the job market is very inflexible in Portugal. It's in the US, for in instance, it is more flexible. So in Portugal, I was lucky to do the change that I did, and uh, Gonzalo also referred it, to, to move from finance to marketing. But maybe it was easier for me because I had a company in my family. If I didn't, I know it would be difficult to, to, to make these changes because the market is quite rigid. And if your background is in finance and you're applying to a marketing job, for instance, it's, it's not very obvious. So the choices that you do in the start are are very important. But I think it's a very general question, not an easy one, but, uh, but I think. And being curious and trying to know as much as, uh, as you can about all these areas and try to find ways that are pleasurable for you, either is to read or to listen or to, to, to find knowledge in, in different ways so that you can understand as early as you can which are the areas that you really like and then that really ma make you happy about uh, management because that will, that will help you make a, a good start to your career. Um, then we have a question from Nuno Bastos. Um, thank you for your speech. I would like to know what is your vision about what would be the new challenges for management and your specific company in a post-COVID environment? Yes, things are changing rapidly and uh, wine is not an ex exception. Things are definitely going, going to change. Uh, one thing that might not be very obvious uh, is the importance of brands, and I'm gravitating to marketing again, but that's an interesting one. Uh, that's something that people re repeat it, but m brands are, are more important than ever. Uh, that's why this is growing importance. Why? Because in the COVID era, People really gravitated to the, to the brands that they know. That was a very strong trend in the market. Uh, people don't spend too much time in the store. They want to purchase quickly and they want to be safe. They, are, they, they feel that they want to be safe. And uh, so they want to go to safe heavens, to, to whatever makes them comfortable. So the, 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 the wines that are sold out there but don't have a recognized brand suffered and the ones that have a well-known brand were benefited. And I believe this is a trend that can and, and, and should continue. And so invest, investing in brands or from your perspective, working with brands might be, might be always interesting. Of course, the online market is something that's going to change uh, a lot also. Portugal actually is one of the countries where it's going less fast than other countries, but uh, online consumption is, is growing. That is going to change a lot in, in, in retail. So there are challenges ahead. I don't know what's going to happen to restaurants if people are going in the future to continue going as, uh, as often. Are they going to order more to eat at home? So that's a totally different uh, market. So a lot of things are, are going to change, that's for sure. Okay, so uh, we are running out of time for the session. So I'm going to just to share one additional question, okay? And then um, all the questions that will not be answered I ask the favor to send them to me, and then if our speaker, uh, well, in a very generous way, takes some time yes. to reply to them, uh, I would appreciate. So the final one comes from uh, Bernard Guimarães, and so what, when Martin talked about acquiring knowledge, um, he's referring to specific knowledge, having in account the job where we are, or it can be a more general type of knowledge. As I think Bernardo, they're both. I would say both uh, depends. If it's something, it's something you, you like and it's sometimes different from what you're working on, it, it's always interesting to fool your knowledge, at least keep, you know, the, the, the brain is like any other muscle. So the more you, you go to the gym, uh, the stronger you become. So it's, it, I think it's, it's not a waste of time to read a, a, 
to read a book or go to a class about something that's not directly related to your job today. It might be useful tomorrow. But of course, if that relates to a practical experience that you have in your, in your daily life, then that's much better because you're going to incorporate and absorb that information uh, much, uh, much, much easier. So if you're working in IT, if you read a book about IT, that's going to resonate a lot, a lot more to you. And so there's so much knowledge av available these days. I mean, it was not the same when myself and Gonzalo graduated, but today, I mean, you, you have, you go to the internet and you can find knowledge about anything. So you can never get enough about knowledge about the job that you're working in. So uh, it's just a matter of, of being curious and starting to, to research. And you'll, I'm sure you'll find experiences from, uh, from, from people, something actually I was thinking about is like, for example, to read is about uh, self-biographies. I mean, if you read about people who've done a career in your area uh, of, of expertise, that's also something that's going to improve your knowledge. So just, just an example of so many ways you can acquire knowledge in a specific field that you're interested in or that you work in. OK, so great, Martin. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, we are running out of time because uh, our students, as all know, we, you are going now to have in virtual rooms meetings with the director of your respective program. Um, uh, links have been sent, so hopefully you have received them. And um, But before we, we finalize, and they are scheduled for 7, so we are a little bit delayed, but it's fine. I already gave the note to the directors that are waiting for you, so no stress with that. Just a final note that is, uh, of course, in the context we are living, um, the personal contact is not the same as it was in previous years, but the school is making a huge effort to maximize your engagement with the community. And those are, those are not empty words. We are really pushing hard to have you here. So 50% of your lectures minimum will be here uh, with the conditions that we have, and they have been carefully studied. And we are on top of that, we are trying to design and, and promote activities that bring at least your cohort together. Because also, as, as Martin emphasized during, this, uh, during this, his speech, and in fact, one of the first key ideas was the importance of the boss. I think that it's very important, the boss, because of the personal examples that you get from him or her. When you have a cohort of students, th that has no price. So to understand how different people can be and how differently they can react. So maximizing your engagement with your community as a whole and with your cohort in particular is a maximum priority for us. And we design things to, under the circumstances that we are going through, uh, guarantee that. And so uh, this was my final, uh, let's say, remark. Uh, I sincerely hope that uh, you enjoy uh, this new academic year. I think it will be very exciting. Um, and uh, all the best for all of you during the next uh, 12 months. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Martin, for your time. Thank you. It was great.